Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Good day everyone. We are today living in the era of transplantation. The management of patients with end organ diseases where there is no hope of medical management, one has to resort to transplantation. Now even in India the setup is quite modern. You have a lot of centers which are investing heavily in transplantation of solid organs and hematopoietic system. But one pertinent problem does remain which is graft rejection. Now we will try to understand in the coming half an hour or so about the mechanisms underlying the rejection of these grafts and the shoe transplants thereof. Now what is transplant rejection? If you want to break down the entire definition, it is simplified into these three important terms. It is a process basically by which the recipient, that is the one who is receiving the graft, his or her immune system recognizes the graft of the donor as foreign and attacks it. Quite simply put, it is attacking the donor's tissue. Now this is a very complex process as um, it involves a lot of cells of the body mechanisms. Both cell mediated and circulating antibodies do play a very active role in rejection of the graft. Now if you want to study this systematically, there are two important steps by which this convenes. One important step is first and foremost, it has to recognize the alloantigens in the grafts. Now basically the donor class 1 and class 2 MHC antigens which we have discussed a couple of classes earlier, they are present on the antigen presenting cells within the grafts and then they are recognized by the host cells. That is step 1. What should happen next? It should mount a response subsequently which is both T cell mediated and antibody mediated response and it is a very strong and a robust response against the cells in the graft of the donor. Let us study the little mechanisms, the step 1 in a little detail, recognition of alloantigens on the grafts. Now there are two pathways which are postulated by which this happens. It can be a combination of both. By and large it is the direct pathway. By direct they infer that the donor class 1 and class 2 MHC antigens on the donor antigen presenting cells or APCs as we have called it here are recognized first by the host cells. So the host cells will encounter the molecules on the graft cells. The indirect pathway is the recipient's T cells will recognize the MHC antigens of the graft only after they are processed and presented by the host cells. So it is a technicality basically how the antigens on the donor cells are presented to the recipient. So that decides whether it is direct or indirect but like I said you can have a combination of both. Now this is a schematic representation which is put up on your screen as you can see on the top of your chart there the antigen presenting cells. Let us take the context of kidney transplant. Now kidneys are transplanted into patients with end stage renal disease or CKD5 as a nephrologist would want to term it. Now let us consider for discussion purpose that these cells which are represented in light blue there are antigen presenting cells which are present on the graft. Now they express molecules of MHC class 1 and class 2. And of course we know by class restriction you have CD4 and CD8 molecules engaging these MHC antigens. Now CD8 is a very robust response like we have said earlier it is cytotoxic or suppressor. What they do is immediately they will attack the blood vessels within the kidney. So as indicated schematically there you can see that the CD8 cells reach the blood vessels and begin to attack the endothelium. They latch on themselves to the endothelium and cause endotheliitis or swelling of the endothelium. Eventually what this does do? It causes increase in the vascular permeability. Now with this results in a lot of changes in the hemodynamic structure and from our previous classes on hemodynamics we know that once the integrity of the endothelial system is hampered it is a potent ground for thrombus formation. So here it results in the formation of small hyaline microthrombi within the vessels of the kidney.
Now what CD8 cells also do is they interact with another important component of the kidney graft which is the tubule. Like indicated at the bottom of the screen there the CD8 cells directly attack the epithelium of the proximal and distal convoluted tubules resulting in tubular injury and irreparable damage to the tubular basement membrane as well. CD4 cells also do play a mechanism. They transform into the helper T cells which are a storehouse of interleukins and cytokines predominantly interferon gamma and they also potentiate this mechanism. Also what it does in indirect pathways like we have said earlier is CD4 and 8 molecules will attack. They also engage other cells of the immune system such as the macrophages which cause tubulitis and tubular damage and they also sometimes the B cells also have a mechanisms because they also recognize uh, the antigens on the grafts. They transform themselves into immunoglobulin producing factories namely your plasma cells as you can see in the right of your screen which produce more and more immunoglobulins and we know that these can go and attach themselves to the antigens present on the renal blood vessels causing endotheliitis and thrombi. So the net result basically by direct or indirect pathway is there is a rejection of the graft mediated predominantly at the level of the tissue by thrombi formation in the blood vessels and tubulitis and tubulo interstitial injury. Step 2 is T cell and antibody mediated reactions. The T cell mediated reactions if you have to study them if they can be clubbed as acute predominantly acute cellular rejection as the name itself signifies it is within days or months after the post operative period. Now these patients in the context again of renal transplant present usually with acute renal failure. The signs and symptoms could range anywhere between oliguria, anuria, rising blood urea nitrogen, creatinine levels and other manifestations. It is predominantly to do if you want to pin the blame here you have to blame it on the CD4 T cell mediated cytokine release and overall what does it do? It results in activation of the macrophages and lymphocytes bringing a lot of pro-inflammatory mediators which eventually hinder your vascular permeability which increases and then resultant in graft injury. But these patients are the ones who respond very well to immunosuppressants. Should you be sharp enough to institute these drugs immediately you can counter acute cellular rejection mediated by T cells. You can see some of the morphological patterns here as depicted. You can get a very tubular institutional pattern which is very common. Sometimes the nephrologist will send you a biopsy and you have to study it. These are the areas of interest where you want to see. You can see a tubulo interstitial pattern where it causes inflammation of the tubule, tubular injury in terms of sloughing of the lining cuboidal epithelium into the lumina. It can result in lot of inflammatory cells in the stroma of the kidney which if you do an immunohistochemistry you can find out that they are CD4 and CD8 cells. The vascular pattern predominantly is endotheliitis, very plump endothelial cells and opening up of the junction between the endothelium it results in the necrosis of the vessel walls. One particular necrosis as you see encasing the walls of the vessels, a lymphocytic infiltrate which is impinging somewhere in between the endothelium which is seen here on the schematic representation. You can see the photomicrograph on your left is a past stained photomicrograph here on the left of your screen which is showing a tubular interstitial pattern of injury. You can see that there is an outline of the tubule which is magenta pink in color and all the blues those are the inflammatory cells trying to navigate through the lining epithelium. Whereas on the right you can see this is a endothelial injury which is mediated by cells. You can see the lining endothelial cells are very plump and then you can see the inflammatory cells also engaging the lining epithelium resulting in vascular injury. The antibody mediated reaction or B cell mediated reaction can be clubbed under three types if you want to study them. The chief among them is what is called as hyperacute rejection. By hyperacute it immediately occurs within hours. We have seen sometimes within uh, let us say the end of the day the operation was done in the morning by evening you can see the rejection. This is a very typical pattern which is followed by hyperacute rejection. It has to do principally with the formation of preformed antibodies in the recipient's blood. So screening becomes a very important mechanism here. You ought to screen these patients for preformed antibodies. Some of the profile of these patients typically could be a multi-para because of multiple deliveries based upon the ABO and the RH incompatibility. They are also sensitized people previous transplant failures. These are many people who turn up for the second transplant because the first one would have uh, completely deranged but they have been sensitized earlier. Multiple blood transfusion in the era now that we are doing 
transfusions which is Paxil's these do have come down but there are areas and centers even in our country where multiple blood transfusions occurs not necessarily restricted to cell components. These are the ones who are very vulnerable to develop a hyperacute rejection. So like I said it occurs within minutes or hours. Anuria and hematuria is the ones that you look out for. Uh, if they are supervening, you do the investigations, you can understand that you are in the terrain of hyperacute rejection. And it looks something like this. If you take a biopsy of the kidney, you can see a central glomerulus in this photomicrograph. Very cellular, a lot of areas of pink within the glomeruli, which is mild mesangial expansion. You can see some uh, reddish structures there. Those are the ones which are the blood vessels with the microthrombi. And then they are all of these cells you can see the blue ones there, those are the neutrophilic infiltrate which are engaging there. If you look at the, some of the arterioles, you will see fibrinoid necrosis, you will see the pink material deposited on the vessel walls. This results in formation of infarcts in the renal cortex and ultimately a kidney which is very flaccid, almost like a bag of urine which then collapses under its own weight resulting in failure of the graft. The next in line is what is called as acute rejection, after hyperacute you have acute. Acute itself suggests the time frame is somewhere in order of say let's days to weeks. The recipients usually are not previously sensitized to a transplant antigen, that's a distinction, uh, another distinction I would say between hyperacute and acute rejection. These have to do um, mainly to exposure to class 1 and class 2 HLA antigens in the donor graft which can evoke the formation of antibodies and it incites an inflammatory response, a complement dependent cytotoxicity and also an antibody B dependent cytotoxicity. All of this we have studied under hypersensitivity reaction. You may want to refer back to that mechanism there to understand this acute reaction a little better. This is how it looks like. You can see on the left of your screen, which is a past stained image. Again, there you can see tubulitis and inflammation. On the right of the screen, which is little brown, is actually an immunohistochemistry which is done there. You can see that within the glomerulus there are cells usually which are CD4 mediated one. So, a deposits of C4D, the complement component is a very important facet here to identify that it is an acute mediated damage. The third one in line is chronic as itself suggests it develops very insidiously and gradually over a period of years and typically affects your vasculature. You can demonstrate antibodies here but not in the graft but in the circulation. So, you can screen them by doing a serum assay and the profile of these patients with the presenting complaint is usually that of a progressive renal failure which has taken more than typically more than 6 months but it can last up to years even. Again to, uh, again to underline this you can see the light microscopy images on the left of your screen, a very cellular glomerulus where there are inflammatory cells within your glomerular loops which is called as glomerulitis accumulation of lot of mesangial matrix which is very pink in color and duplication of basement membrane. You can do a silver stain that will show you that lining basement membrane which is duplicated. Whereas on the right of the screen is showing uh, it is a mason trichrome. You can see the ones which are marked in green is an area of fibrosis. So, a lot of interstitial fibrosis and then sometimes an artery which shows arteriolosclerosis of the tunica media. Now, what are the chances that you can increase the survival of the graft? That is your goal basically. You want to increase the survival level of the graft. You can do it what is called as a HLA matching. Now, you can select a donor and a recipient and screen whether there is compatibility between both of these. You can use serological tests, a good old lymphocyte cytotoxicity test will do or a CDC cross match is a screener. You can do a DSA donor specific antibodies by modern assays or even a flow cytometry cross match is good enough. But these are documentations required. Should there be a negative reaction then you know that you can transplant the graft and then look forward for a better survival rate. You can also resort yourself to drugs. Lot of drugs are available now which are immunosuppressants. They range from steroids which are good old ones right up to mycophenolate morphetal, tacrolimus and even pooled intravenous immunoglobulins go a long way in survival of the graft. The latest in the trend is plasma pheresis where you can put it through filters and filter out all the antibodies. Those are the ones which help in the solid organ transplant. But there is slight distinction within the hematopoietic stem cells or HSCs as we have called it here. Transplantation of these, the indications range anyway between a bone marrow failure or let us say a thalassemic individuals or even patients with leukemias where there is no minimal residual disease. 
It can be uh, ranging anyway from anemias which are non-responsive to therapy. There is a litany of indications for these. Now here you harvest the cells of interest from the peripheral blood itself or from the bone marrow and in case of children you can preserve the umbilical cord blood which is of course now is mushrooming into a merchandise itself. Now here you can harvest the stem cells which have a capacity to multiply and differentiate along multiple lines are the ones are the cells of interest. Now the preparation of the patient becomes very important just a footnote on this that you have to blunt the immune system of the recipient. Imagine this you are putting a immunocompetent donor cells into a recipient who is immunodeficient relatively speaking. Now there are problems with this which we will discuss in the ensuing slides but remember that you have to irradiate the recipient so as to make him more responsive. You can use chemotherapy, you can use um, radiation which basically blunts the immune system and potentiates the graft to be taken up. The problems that it brings with is immune deficiency as we discussed earlier and the manifestations thereof and graft versus host disease. Now graft versus host disease is a very important phenomenon over the years we have seen that the prevalence of this has come down uh, given a lot of education that um, a continuing education in the field of transplantation also the drugs which are available and a very diligent nature to screen the patients has brought down this but you see sporadic cases which is important because management of these patients is very vital. Now graft versus host disease is simply put like I said earlier you are transplanting immunocompetent cells of the donor into a immunodeficiency or immunologically crippled I would say recipient. You are deliberately crippling it and you are putting competent cells. Now that imbalance there manifests in graft versus host disease. The transferred host cells recognize the alloantigens on the host and begin to attack them right away. Now here in the case of hematopoietic stem cell transplants you can they can be causes of blood which are irradiated transfusion or liver transplants which are very rich in lymphoid tissue these are the hotbed issues where you can get a possibility of graft versus host disease. This is a schematic representation showing the same you can see on the left of the screen there is a recipient conditioning where you irradiate the patient and try to blunt his or her immune system. But some of these antigens will be picked up by the donor cells, the donor T cells as they are being grafted into the patient. They will recognize this and they multiply in number by reacting to the antigens which have been encountering uh, recently and they produce a lot of interleukins such as interleukin 2 or interleukin 6 even interferon gamma resulting in donor T cell activation and then results on the latter half of your screen you can see the effecta phase where they begin to attack different systems of the body ranging from the skin, the gut and the liver. Accordingly you can have an acute versus chronic um, GVHT and acute again occurs within days both CD8 and uh, 4 cells mediate this. Usually the patient comes to you with a generalized rash and skin desquamation very erythematous rashes on the surface of the skin. There will be destruction of small bile ducts and resultant jaundice so you do an LFT it will show up that there is small derangement in the profile of the patient and then in the gut they present usually with diarrhea, usually bloody in nature because a lot of ulcerations in the lining mucosa. Chronic has all of these symptoms but they are more insidious so gradually they progress and there is a lot of destruction of the dermal appendages of the skin resulting in fibrosis. They come with very skin which is very fibrous and thick. Cholestatic liver disease because of plugging of the bile pigment within the hepatocytes um, there is they have jaundice. They also come with the itching and pruritus because of the accumulation of bile salts. In the esophagus they can result in stricture so the patient will have dysphagia which is difficulty in swallowing food or odinophagia which is very painful swallowing of the food substances. It can result in involution of the thymus especially in younger age group and depletion of lot of lymphocytes even within the lymphoid system. So basically a net result of all of this is that your immune system is completely devastated resulting in very recurrent infections more often than not they are life threatening. There is also a concept of autoimmunity here which is being debated about in literature you can look up and read about this quite interesting facet of graft versus host disease. Now how do you prevent this? You can do again like an HLA match so molecular typing of HLA alleles and actually effective match between the donor and recipient should go a long way in preventing this and also sometimes you can deplete the pool of the donor T cells before the transplant. Okay, so these are some of the mechanisms by which you can address and try to reduce the incidences of 
graft versus host disease. Now this brings us to the end of this particular facet of the immune system which is transplant pathology. So it's good to read about this, there are a lot of pertinent issues here. So I hope you have had a good time reading about this. Thank you.